Go ahead. Oh. <laughs> so uh, my name is Mark Knobloch. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Houston and uh, been there for just uh, finished my fifth year, starting my sixth year. I've uh, been uh, certified as an athletic trainer since 1996. So I think 24 years. I've uh, been in Texas, licensed for uh, 20 years now. And um, also uh, as a clinical professor, clinical education coordinator at the University of Houston, and uh, certified as a strength conditioning specialist. Uh, background, real quickly, I got my undergraduate degree at Wichita State uh, in, in exercise science, did my master's degree at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, got my master's in kinesiology, and then I worked clinically for uh, a year as athletic trainer at a, at a university, I'm sorry, at a junior college, and then uh, spent the next seven years at Lamar University in Beaumont as a head athletic trainer, and then returned to uh, school full-time, left a full-time job, went back to school full-time, and became a uh, PhD student at the University of Houston, and finished in 2011, and then went to the Texas Medical Center, and I did a two-year uh, postdoc, two-and-a-half-year postdoc in, in uh, molecular physiology and biophysics is the actual term. I, my area was skeletal muscle physiology, and so we studied, I looked at statins and, and why we get sore after, uh, extra, I'm sorry, after uh, taking statins, some of us, and why it mimics uh, strenuous work, I guess. Uh, and so finished that and then came to the University of Houston and been very happily employed for the last over five years now. So, so that's what I was going to have you just start with that. Uh, just the, the scenario and then we're going to come back to that. But <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Dr. Knobloch is joining us because he's talking about imbalance and disequilibrium. All right. And so this episode is sportsmedicinebroadcast.com slash disequilibrium. And if you can't spell that, then you can search Knobloch. And I, I also in the notes and misspelled his name in case you can't spell his <laughs> Never name. Never happened before. I'm so shocked. <laughs> right. And so um, if, you, if you're struggling, you can always, imbalance is also in the title. So again, this is sportsmedicinebroadcast.com slash imbalance. So Dr. Knobloch, he's, he sent me a book to, to read and it's got a story, a personal story. But before we start with that, um, I, w I want to I want you to know, like, this is we're talking about imbalance and disequilibrium, and when it is not a concussion. So, if we're looking at when it is not a concussion, so tell me one of those scenarios where I need to change the way I'm thinking. Uh, okay, I will give you a very short answer and follow it with a long answer. Anytime somebody comes in with dizziness, especially after head trauma, it's that simple, and I. I talk about this topic because we are, you know, both of, us, both of us sitting here are athletic trainers. A lot of our listeners are going to be athletic trainers. And we all have been ingrained with this same uh, ideal. If there's head trauma, the person has got to, you've got to evaluate them for concussion. And if their symptoms are they're dizzy, they're unsteady, they have ringing in the ears, regardless of, mus regardless of memory loss, They've got a concussion. And I'm here to tell you I need, we need to completely rethink that. Uh, and I will also, I mean, absolutely, probably 80, 90% of the time, that's exactly what they do have. But there's so little talk in our education and in our profession about vestibular disorders because it's very, very well known that some vestibular disorders actually start from head trauma. We'll get into one in a little while shortened name is BPPV, the long name is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, that actually up to 20% of the time comes from head trauma. That's how it happened to me. Uh, and I'll describe that in a little bit. But the symptoms of it are so parallel with concussion. It's dizziness, vertigo, potentially ringing in the ears, unsteadiness, imbalance. And <clears throat> again, it started from head trauma. And so there's got to be some sort of uh, a change in our in our in our education in our mindsets that we we can't just focus on concussion and so that's kind of what my passion has become is to get this out there because i've been a 
patient of many vestibular disorders, unfortunately, but at the same time, it kind of exposed me to this because I came up with the mindset, you know, same way. We're taught you have a concussion if you have these conditions. You know, we're going to diagnose you with that. Memory loss is obviously something, loss of consciousness is a big deal. But if you don't have those, we still say, oh, it's, you've got to have a concussion because you're complaining of dizziness and it's, you, you, the room starts spinning when you lay down. Well, yes, that's very possible, but let's start thinking outside that box and start thinking of these very common conditions that the general population has. And that's another part of my, my reason for wanting to, to get this out is because there's such a mindset of athletes. Well, what about the normal 60-year-old individual that complains of dizziness or complains of headache? Well, if it's not concussion, they didn't have head trauma, well, it's got to be their heart, correct? Because, you know, your, your heart's not pumping hard enough. And so... Uh, we need to kind of get out of it. I need to work to get us out of this mindset of it's it's got to be this concussion because that's all I know is if there's head trauma of any sort, dizziness, disequilibrium, tinnitus, whatever going on. Well, what else could it be? We just aren't exposed to that. And so um, that's kind of what what I'm trying to to help us recognize and, and get those other conditions out there. So. All right. So if we're. We're talking about, like you just said, I got a kid that is hitting the head and the kid is dizzy. There, I need to take that as, as there is something going on, but it may not be a concussion. So we need to do some more evaluation. Mm-hmm. All right, so um, tell me just a little bit more about some of the other things that we're going to look at there. And then we're going to kind of go into your story after that. Okay. Well, the first thing is you always start with the worst. Let's rule out concussion. And that, and I, again, I'm saying that the, the majority of what you're going to have are concussions. This is going to be the tricky one or maybe the non-head trauma, but they're having dizzy. In a, in a young athlete, you shouldn't have that. I mean, it could be their heart, but um, there are spontaneous or idiopathic uh, causes for some of these things. Vestibular migraine, Meniere's disorder, or sorry, Meniere's disease, BPPV are all related to the same <clears throat> source and they give very similar symptoms of vertigo and then you have things like headache and, and etc so one of the one of the major uh, <clears throat> issues with vestibular disorders such as uh, uh, Meniere's disease and vestibular migraine is they don't have any good tests for them it really comes down to patient history and uh, symptoms so when you say special tests, we can't go get a blood test. We can't do a, a tissue biopsy and things like that. It really comes down to, okay, you've had this ruled out. You don't have, you know, you had a CT scan or whatever. Uh, you had no memory loss. It, it just doesn't make sense as a concussion. We need to get you vis, uh, established for, or sorry, evaluated for these other conditions. And they have very specific uh, diagnostic criteria. Uh, in kids, there's a younger condition called benign positional vertigo that's very common with headaches and, and dizziness. So it's it's something that's going to take a bit of work. It's not something you go and learn a quick test. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, BPPV is interesting. And, and again, I say, I'll say the long word, the long phrase one more time. It's benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. It's, it's not tr- troublesome. It's benign. Paroxysmal, it comes and goes. Positional, depends on the position of the head and it induces vertigo. And so we'll get into like in maybe what in a little bit what those are actually caused from. But that actually has a very quick and very specific test. You have the person position their head, their chin, have them sit on a seat on a table. They turn their head left to the 45 or right 45. You quickly lean them back and let their head hyper, their neck hyperextend a little bit and you watch their eyes. And it's a really, I was fascinated when I learned all this, even though I had it, I didn't know it at the time of how intricate it was but basically the the otoliths or the crystals in your ear have gotten knocked loose and so they actually get trapped in your semicircular canals so there's a very the vestibular ocular reflex is something where we all do it we do it in our cranial nerve tests where if the person turns their head by focusing on something their eyes should stay in one spot well that's because of a link between your semicircular canals and your eye muscles so what happens is when you position them back and you there's a couple other things you can do a couple other tests they actually their eyes just instantly go into massive uh nystagmus and then it usually fades away and it just stops it's they call it fatiguing about 30 seconds or so and all of a sudden wow you have bpbv and if i put you in a different position that doesn't happen and we can actually professionals can actually isolate where those crystals are at 
and it's so cool they can do something called the modified epley maneuver the there's about there's many many tests that based on where the crystals are at they can actually turn you in certain positions those crystals always are falling down because they're heavier than the indolymph they're in they can turn you in certain have you do a series of maneuvers and those crystals actually get worked back into where they belong in the vestibule and you're all of a sudden you're symptom free it's gone so you went from unsteadiness, vertigo with certain head positions. Like you, for me, it was I'd look up and to the right. All of a sudden, I go into massive vertigo. It took me – now, I actually got had that uh, condition when it was really new. And the, the story on Dr. Epley is amazing. He, he th- had a thought about how, what might be going on. He got ridiculed by his peers. They, they called it witchcraft. They, they, they would leave his lectures. And now the position, the procedure is named after him because they was right. It was that simple. So w- when to answer your question, some of them can be fixed very easily. Such, well, really one, uh, BPPV. The rest are unbelievably debilitating and there is no cure. And so vestibular migraine, Meniere's disease, uh, labyrinthitis in a lot of cases, there is no cure. And so these people are often on disability. They, they're unpredictable attacks. So it's kind of, there's a large range. So if you get hit in the head and you have BPPV, you're going to be dizzy and steady, have vertigo at certain times. A lot of times it's when they're rolling over in bed or they're taking a shower and they lean back to, to wash their hair off and all of a sudden it hits. So it depends, you know, and, and if you can recognize it as BPPV, it's a very simple fix. If it's not, and you start thinking, do they have Meniere's disease or, or, or tinnitus or something along those lines, then they need a, a pretty good referral. They're going to need to see the right kind of physician and get a pretty good workup on that. So, um, but again, I go back to BPV. That is 20% of the time that's induced by head trauma. And that's how it happened to me. Uh, got kneed in the head accidentally and just wham, all of a sudden vertigo scared the heck out of me. I had, no, I, I didn't know if I was having a stroke. I had having a little mini seizure or what, and then come to find out six months later, because I, have, I was mentioning Dr. Epley, his research had not really caught on when I first had it, but it, the audiologist I used, she actually had been trained in it, and it completely fixed me. But you don't know what's, when you have it, you have no idea how overpowering it is until it's actually happened, and then you're like, this, is, this can't be just little crystals. Nothing could cause me to just fall against the wall all of a sudden. So, um, yeah, but there are tests for some of them you can do, and some of them... It's what we call a disease of exclusion. So you've ruled out everything else. You've ruled out brain tumor, vestibular neuroma in the ear, uh, stroke. It's all those. If all those things are not present physically, and these are your symptoms, you're left with this condition most likely. So, all right. So uh, I went to school. You know, did the anatomy. We learned about the ear, the inner ear, and the otolith. Like, from what I remember, it's basically, you know, like, they call them ear stones. It's just like mm-hmm. this little piece that's kind of sitting on top of this gel. Mm-hmm. And so you're saying by twisting the person, they can get it to set back on that gel, and then it'll They get it'll back into the vestibule. In. You're clo- you're, they, we don't actually, they, the research doesn't actually say it goes on in that gel, but it goes back into the vestibule where they belong. So they're very tiny. It's, it's interesting. Fish have huge ones. I mean, they look like a marble. In humans, they're average 0.0004 inches long. I mean, they are microscopic. And so they actually, they're calcium carbonate, they're crystals. And so they have weight and they're heavier than the fluid that's the indolymph that's in the ear. So they're embedded in this gelatinous layer. Just like you said, you have two organs that have them. You have the saccule and the utricle. One gives you vertical movement sensation and one's horizontal. So if you want to think about, think of it as them as basically the, the nerves that, that are underneath them are either vertical. And so these crystals are on top of those nerves in this gel layer. So when you move forward, the weight of those crystals causes that gel to kind of lag behind as, as inertia. Or if you go up in an elevator, those crystals, the weight kind of pushes down. And so that's how your body gets feedback. Well, those crystals are actually attached by proteins, very, very microscopic proteins. One, those proteins can degrade over time. And two, you, trauma can actually knock those crystals out of the gel and then they're, they're just a rock, so they just fall down. And so I would say most people have a few loose right now. I love to say you have a few <laughs> rocks loose, because you do. It's not a big deal if they stay in the actual vestibule where those two organs, the saccule and the utricle, are at. It's when you lay down, and then the, the rocks kind of roll along the side, 
and then maybe you turn over in bed, all of a sudden, boom, they're in your, your uh, semicircular canals. And that's not a problem. The problem is, is when they push up against the, 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 ner the sensor nerves in there, there's a little, it's kind of a cool thing. The fluid in your ear is supposed to move when you move. Well, if you think it, you have a little organ in there called the cupula. The cupula is basically feeling the motion of that fluid move. So it bends one way. Well, you, your body's getting feedback that's moving and that's bending. Your, your brain ignores it. What happens is when that cupula moves when you're not moving, it's like, wait a minute, that's not supposed to be happening. So if I tilt my head back and those rocks push up against that, it makes the nerves fire, which is telling my brain that I'm moving when I'm really not. So the cupula is kind of like, I, I give the example of if you put a branch, a green branch in a stream, you're going to see the branch bend and you take it out, it goes back. And that's kind of what's happening. So, yeah. So the intent is those, those odalis rocks, whatever you want to call them are, are in there. And so you're, you start to position this person to move. So those rocks keep falling downward due to gravity and you roll them this way, they fall down more. They roll them this way, they get back into the vestibule and right there, they're stuck and they're not pushing on that cupula anymore. And they're actually, I don't know, we don't know if they reattach or, or what, or if you lose them over time. We do know that the proteins degrade, they tend to come loose. So it's in more common in older individuals, but people have had it after surgery, they've woke up and had BPPV with no trauma. So um, that's really with that specific condition of BPPV, it's simply the rocks came loose. They're pushing up on your sensor nerves that's falsely telling your brain that you're moving when you're really not. It's just because something heavy is pushing up against there. And so just the, as far as we, as we know now, there's not a way to reattach them. Not to the gel that I know of, but we get them back in the vestibule where there's not this uncontrolled movement going on. So yeah, and, and to give you an example, with, they call it positional vertigo because if you're not in a position that causes them to fall up against that cupula, you don't notice it at all. Some, and it depends on which canal they're in. They usually get in the posterior canal most commonly. If you get in the anterior, it's actually kind of like an inverted U, so it's hard for them to get up in there. It's rare that you have that condition. You have the horizontal canal and the, and the posterior canal. So if they get in there, you know, it depends on what position. Some people, like myself, if I was standing upright and looked, kind of put my ear towards my shoulder, that would cause my vertigo. And then I put my head back and it goes away. And it's, I could do it back and forth over and over and over. There's about a five second lag and it would usually last about 30 seconds. Some people, it might be laying on their side and they're in a different canal. So, so yeah. So getting them back into that gel, I don't know if, I don't suspect that's possible because the gel is actually in the middle of the vestibule and the rocks will just fall down. So the chance of you positioning them right to get them to stick back in there long enough to reattach proteins, probably pretty, pretty rare, but um, just getting them in the vestibule gets them away from the, a lot of the sensor nerves. Yeah. All right. So you've kind of gone around uh, telling, telling some of your story throughout mm -hmm. this, but let's kind of start with the beginning um, of your story and then how you got to where it is. And also let me tell you that Dr. Knobloch has written a couple books and he's got an offer for you that we're going to be talking about later on mm -hmm. towards the end of this. So check, uh, stick it out, check around. I'm not going to post the offer anywhere. So you got to listen either the Facebook, the YouTube or Sneaky. the audio podcast. So check it out. Um, and then that way you can see what his special offer is. So what is your story? Yeah, so I'm actually, I've had multiple vestibular conditions. And so that actually is what ironically triggered me to focus on this area. Um, the first thing happened just con very rather conspicuously. I was uh, one night, this was in 2001, I believe, uh, participating in martial arts. And I went to somebody that was with me, went to demonstrate a move. So I laid on my back. They went to kneel next to me and their knee just just knocked me right in the side of the head. And for a split second, it just hurt. But then within a couple seconds, just this overwhelming shaking went on. It was, I mean, it was the strangest feeling. And I shot up instantly. And then it was re really weird because I went up, I stood up, all of a sudden I'm fine. Like what, you know, you, so you, that's a funny thing. You start thinking, did that really just happen? because I absolutely went from just the room shaking and spinning to absolutely normal. So I walked around for a minute and the person with me was asking what's going on. And, uh, you know, I said, I don't know, that was weird. So I went to lay back down and boom, it hit again. And I just shot up. I was just paranoid at that time, really freaking out. Drove home, no issues. Next morning in the shower, as commonly happens. Taking a shower, 
rinse the soap out of your hair, you tilt your head back, wham, hits again, drops me down onto my knees. I said, this is crazy. I'm, you know, I'm literally freaking out. Didn't know what was going on. Never had anything like this before other than minor headache or something. Um, so over a series of, of months, it continued. But I learned that only if I tilt my head back to the right, give it about five seconds, the vision would go, I'd say gray, because the thing would shake so bad you can't see anything. It's just massive vision. It was actually interesting. I call it the bow tie effect because what would happen is the outer portion of my vision would shake larger than the inside. So it was like, it was this very strange, hard to explain, but it looked like my vision would turn into a bow tie. Like the outsides would shake crazy, very blurry. The middle wasn't too bad. And then if I repositioned my head or I held it long enough, it would, it would just go away. And so eventually uh, I talked to my GP and he said, uh, you know, I think it might be this. And again, this was really new. This was in 2001 when Dr. Epley really he was just starting to get accepted. I went to an audiologist. She diagnosed me. Uh, and she did the procedure it's called the Epley maneuver, which is, it takes about three or four minutes. They just position me. She actually said it was ironic. She said my, my nystagmus is the worst she'd ever seen when it was going on. So I thought, I, I kind of thought that was kind of cool at the moment because it wasn't all in my head. At least she said, wow, this is really bad. And so got it done back then. I had to wear a neck brace for two days. Um, and I had to sleep upright because they thought you had to let those things basically reattach. Now we don't do that. You could do it in your bedroom, fix yourself if it's the regular traditional BPPV. So uh, went fine for a while, had no issues, but I started having headaches. And this is about probably six months later. I noticed I, there was one day I, I've never had what I considered back then to be a migraine, but this was, this was a hot, I it got bad enough at work that I went home, which I very rarely do. I said, I don't like where this is heading. It was just on the top of my head and really bad headache. And so I went home, tried ice. I was doing everything. And I said, I'm going to have to go to the hospital. And I actually laid in bed. I said, I just need to, if I can just sleep and this isn't, if this isn't gone, I'm going to the hospital. Woke up and it was the strangest thing. The headache was completely gone. But I had a very, I shouldn't say complete, I had a very small headache. I thought it'll go away. And over the next uh, six, eight months, I had a continuous headache. It was the strangest thing. And I thought, well, is BPPV still going on or what? And uh, it was, it just remained and it, it just became something you lived with. So uh, about a year or two later, the headache had dis largely uh, it was still present, but then I noticed about a year or two later, it started getting worse. And then I actually started saying, okay, this is not right. Went to the doctor, saw a GP, saw an ENT, uh, saw a neurologist here in Houston. They had done an MRI. They said, you know, the first guy, uh, said, the first time I saw the neurologist, he said, well, I see something there. I want to, I need another MRI. It turns out it was a blurry spot and it didn't, wasn't anything. So just real quick. Yeah. So this whole year ish that you're having this, like this small headache, does, does Tylenol or anything of the sort seem to help? Once I got to the point where it got a lot worse, started getting worse. I actually started taking what was effectively a Cedrin, Excedrin, which is the caffeine and the acetaminophen that actually improved it. I, couldn't I tried I'd be pro I tried everything over the counter nothing worked but I finally found Excedrin actually reduced it when it got bad so I had I, I tell you about the current book I'm working on I had Excedrin in my car at work in my bag and at home I mean I just had to have it everywhere because it when it wasn't always bad it was always there but it also grew into very excruciating so that went on for man a couple years it just I, again just a constant headache I shouldn't say a couple years probably another year and I was really tolerating it. And then it just kind of went away. And so I thought that was weird, but it's gone. And then uh, I noticed in 2005, I was laying on the couch one day. I'm like, dang, what is that noise? And I kept looking around. I thought it was like a distant fire alarm, or a smoke detector going off. I thought it was a, an alarm on some p like computer. And it was just this very high pitched noise in my right ear. And the next day it was there. And then I started thinking about it more and it would, I would notice it laying in bed and I'd notice it every time I was in a quiet room. Well, six months later, or I probably not that long, 
three months in, I'm like, geez, is this tinnitus? Is this what they talk about? It was only my right ear. So I had that. The headaches were pretty much gone. Um, and then in, I think, yeah, the tinnitus came. And then what I noticed too was that my right ear started to feel really plugged up. And I started thinking that was weird, but it was only my right ear. My left ear was fine. And then I started noticing that I couldn't hear out of my right ear. And it became an issue of, it was so plugged up. It sounded like literally a seashell was up against it, but it also felt congested. So I, I went back to the doctor. No, your eardrums are fine. You know, it's just, it's just must be a virus or, you know, something very nebulous is like, I don't know. It's just, it could be, maybe it's, so okay. I said, okay, well maybe I'll wait it out. Was it swimmer's ear? Is it, is it earwax? Is it, it was none of those. Everything looked fine. But I, all of a sudden, I literally had to turn to hear people out of my left ear because I couldn't hear out of my right. And so the tinnitus was there. It was like a howling sound, and I was effectively unable to hear out of it. And so I started thinking, okay, maybe I'm getting old. I was 31 or 32 at the time, and I lived with that for a while, but you just got used to it. And so um, what really started everything besides just having that was uh it was i think 2008 woke up one morning with massive vertigo just i i I remember i had my cell phone rolled over grabbed my phone to look at what time it was and i couldn't even read my phone i was holding and the this the vision was just so nystagmus was just terrible so i thought i had food poisoning so okay i'll wait it out i'll wake up in the morning it'll be fine well then you start sweating. And so just massive pouring out sweat coming out and tried to kind of just sleep it off. I mean, but you can't cause vertigo, you feel, even though it's just, you sense motion, you feel like you're moving too. So I feel like I'm shifting in the bed so you can't sleep. Then all of a sudden, you know, a little bit of time after that, maybe in 20 minutes or whatever, get a massive urge. I've got a, I've got nausea and it's going to be bad. And I actually went to stand up out of bed and fell right against the wall, just without any warning. Couldn't, you you have no, the vertigo was bad enough, you couldn't have, you didn't have any ability to stay upright. And so I actually got down on my hands and knees, started crawling to the bathroom, knowing I was going to vomit, and I fell over crawling. That's how bad it was. So I'm, you're almost like you're, you, you see, you know, somebody in the dark, like they're just feeling where they're going. And that's what it was. And it was three in the morning, so, you know, it was, it was tired and everything else, but I just could not, could not get there fast enough. Finally did. Um, and to make a long story short, I ended up having Meniere's at the time. I didn't know it then, but with that came vomiting and the vomiting is so strong and powerful that it actually makes your neck and shoulders hurt for a couple days after that. And it, I mean, it is you can't breathe when you're, when it's happening. It's, you know, there's vomiting. Like I, you know, and I'm not trying to, to harp on that, but there's everybody's thrown up and you do it and you're done. This is like extended contractions, full body, full upper body. So anyway, I did that just dripping sweat into the toilet, just profuse sweating, uh, went back to bed, just laid there. I'm like this thing, this food poisoning, um, it's gotta be. And then, um, actually fell asleep. So I woke up in the morning and it's like, here we go again. Did that really happen? Cause I feel fine. I, I thought, but I got up and, uh, had a little bit of unsteadiness and, and actually I have to add, there was one morning about, I think it was in 2003 that I got up very similar unsteady. And that was actually along the headaches. I forgot to add that. I had that where that actually was along with the headaches coming along but I don't remember the vertigo and it just, I was unsteady, I had to hold the walls, but there was a thunderstorm outside. I thought maybe a pressure was bothering me. So that actually was the first thing I forgot. But this major attack, when I, when that hit, I remember going outside and all of a sudden everything, it looked, it looked just like if you go into a pool that's heavy in chlorine, you get out and you're, it's really like bright. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what my vision was like. We call it brain fog and vision fog because you can't, you can't concentrate. And this goes back to the concussion thing. I did not want the morning after I had to go back to UH and do my normal stuff. And I did not want to think it was very hard to concentrate. And the vision was very bright. And, uh, but I was able to walk. I was a little unsteady, no big deal. 
but then everything else started happening. So I had the, 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 I get these weird little ticks every once in a while. I feel like somebody was pulling me to the side or I'd feel like the chair shifted, even though it really didn't. And it was really strange. And so this was kind of one of those things where it just continued. It didn't go away. So I thought food poisoning, it's going to last two days. Then it's three days and four days and a week. And then I noticed the next Monday, I had the exact same thing happen. Woke up on a Monday morning, early in the morning, vomiting. Same thing. Couldn't walk, couldn't, had to crawl, had to vomit, you know, all that stuff. Um, and then I can't remember if it was the third Monday, but there was a, there was a pattern at first, but I remember there was two, the first two happened on Mondays. Well, anyway, this goes on and then, then, uh, it only happened either two or three times. I don't remember, but then, uh, it actually happened once while I was driving and that was, that was a way, a ways into it, but I was on, I was out in, I think Copperfield coming back on 290. I went, I remember dipping my head to look at a sign uh, overpass or a street, a road sign to see where my exit was and boom hits all of a sudden sweating nystagmus starts not too bad, but the shaky vision starts. Uh, I said sweating. Uh, and then you just have this overwhelming urge not to move your head. It's really weird. You just want to stay as stiff as you can. And when you're having it at home, you just want to lay down. There's a, just, I've got to go lay down. Just get out of my way. Let me lay down. Ended up making it back to Meyerland, got out of the car couldn't walk, had to basically hold on to the car around the car, made it to where my entryway was, held the walls, all of a sudden just vomited. It was just weird. And so I'm getting frustrated. Don't know what this, what's going on. Thought, you know, I had tried a couple of times at BPBV re- reoccurring. So I did the positioning myself, didn't do anything. Nobody seemed to know. Everybody's saying, you know, I, uh, I talked to a couple of people. Well, it's just anxiety. It's like, come on. It's not anxiety. Well, you just need to relax. Try. I, I can't relax because I'm frustrated all the time. You know, that was the worst part. People, it's happened multiple times. People, physicians would tell me it's just anxiety, and I'll get to that here in a second. But it's not. It's so I'm, I can't cause forceful vomiting in my head. You know. So anyway, I end up talking to. Uh, oh, one more thing happened was uh, I was at at an intersection and went to. Uh, went to got in the turn lane was the first one at the sitting waiting on the left turn light I pulled my phone out looked at my phone looked down at my phone and bam one hits strangest thing I, I remember tunnel vision is like this there's like a suction sound in my hearing just like just my hearing got really crazy I had this massive shooting up of this weird feeling in my chest and I started panicking so the light turned green I pulled into a CVS parking lot and just started sweating and I cranked on the AC and I, I was supposed to go to work that morning and I was like, I can't, I got to go back. So I ended up making it home. I remember getting out of the car and I kept leaning to the right as I'd walk. I just, I couldn't, I'd try and overcorrect to the left and I'd lean to the right, made it upstairs, just instantly went and laid in bed, got to lay in bed and just waited out. So I emailed my friend. I said, I'm frustrated. I think actually that morning, I remember I, when it was over with a couple hours later, cause you always, it's the same thing. you when you vomit, you're kind of done the sweating keeps going, but then you get overwhelmingly sleepy. You have to sleep. You go and lay, lay in bed, you sleep for an hour, and you pretty much wake up almost normal other than the lingering effects of, like, brain fog and stuff. And so I remember getting on this site called wrongdiagnosis.com, and I typed out my story. I was frustrated because it happened twice while I was driving. And I said, here's what happened. What do you think? And, and I remember the first couple responses are like, I don't know, but we'll pray for you. you know, I don't want to hear that. I want to know what's wrong. And then one, one individual, that third or fourth response said, what it sounds like is you have Meniere's. And I said, no, Meniere's is old people. And it, it, uh, it, it comes, you know, when you're 60 years old. And so I started Googling, this was in 2000, uh, 2009, I think when this was going on. So I'd been living with it for seven, eight months. Um, but, and I was a student, so I couldn't just go to the doctor and get all these tests done. I was a doctoral student at the time and I didn't have a lot of money. And so I didn't want to go and get all this stuff. That's why it took so long to go in, but I was finally frustrated. So I looked up and I started reading Meniere's and it was so, I remember clearly as I read the symptoms, I started getting very anxious because everything fit. 
And I thought, this isn't good because I know you read more stuff and then you read about how it's debilitating and you read things like suicide, disability, this kind. Of, and so I started really getting anxious at that point. So I texted or emailed my friend. I said, he's a physician. I said, hey, I got to come see you. He came or I went and saw him. He says, why don't we send you to a neurologist? I went to the neurologist and the neurologist said, I can't remember, I can't remember the quote now. He's like, it's not a nerve problem. You just need to try and relax. And I almost started bawling. I, I was so mad because I said, I, they did nerve conduction studies on me. They, wa they wanted to do a sleep study on me. I said, it's not a sleep issue. It, the only thing that's a sleep issue is I get so fatigued after it happens that I have to lay down. You have to take a nap. And uh, left there frustrated. Uh, and so continued on, let, lived with it. I actually made it all the way through grad school with it. I, what was frustrating, though, is you're, and I wrote about this in the book, you're constantly thinking about it. I'm talking every Every time you move your head or you move, you're thinking about it. Like, what was that? Uh oh, is this is this an attack coming on? Is oh, you know, you're just constantly the chair moves. You know, I just I thought I walked from the parking lot and past the gym, and there's that tilted sidewalk a little bit. If I'd have been on that, I'd have been a nervous wreck because your body thinks you're on a flat sidewalk, but you're not. So you keep tilting to the right, just a, just micro amounts. But your brain interprets that as oh, I'm losing my balance. Why am I losing my balance? Is it because I'm having an attack? The attacks were the big deal. It wasn't, it wasn't living with the nystagmus or the headache. It was the attacks. The attacks, as I wrote, dominated my life. I have, I have the most fear of those. Those are the most terrible things. And anybody that has them will tell you that. Because you're out for four to six hours. Some people are out for two days. You cannot. I've tried to power through it. I had one happen when I was in, at school and I was trying to do some image analysis and I lean forward to look at something to see it and boom, attack hits. I'm out for four hours. I mean, can't, you can't do anything. You can't see, you have to go somewhere where nobody's going to bother you because you can't be, somebody comes in and you're, you may not be physically bad other than sweating, but your brain, you're just, I mean, everything's spinning, you know, you have to get somewhere where nobody's going to bother you. Um, so I graduated, but I was always paranoid. I still remember my my dissertation defense, I was more scared of having an attack and having to leave and what they would think of that than I was the actual defense. So uh, I happened to get hired on at Baylor College of Medicine, and this was in 2011. So I had been having the symptoms for about three years, had been to a cardiologist because I was having palpitations and anxiety attacks and didn't know it. I just thought it was my heart. Um, had been to a neurologist, a couple ENTs, uh, a couple GPs at different times and an audiologist and all of them, nobody knew what was going on at the time. So to kind of give you the final stage of what happened, I was at Baylor and I'd been, I started in August and happened to get invited back to UH to go out for this little kind of get together they had on a Thursday night. And while I was there, I was talking to one of the professors who happened to work with some astronauts. And he, I had talked to him briefly about what was going on just in passing. And he, he's like, no, I don't think you have Meniere's. You're too young. And so I kind of, well, an expert told me that. So I talked to him and I said, you know, I just, I'm still having these attacks and I'm constantly dizzy. Like right now, you know, I was telling him my, my vision's shaky and I can't hear out of my right ear. And he said, well, I said, it, I said, you know, it might be Meniere's. He's like, well, who told you that? And I said, nobody. He's like, well, here's what I want you to do. I've got a friend down in the med center. I want you to go see her. She works for an otoneurologist, which I never even knew there was one. Um, and so I emailed her and I kind of spilled my guts, which you tend to do when you're frustrated. You just tell everybody. I mean, if you just said, if you'd email me when I was sick and said, hey, Mark, I heard you have some ear problems. You want to come talk about it? I would have sent you four pages of what's going on because I just want to talk about it. Somebody help me. And uh, so I saw her. I scheduled a point with her. I was on, actually, I was taking... Uh, Xanax at the time, I'm, I have no fear of saying that because I was so nervous. Just 100% of the time, I'm thinking about it. You talk about being distracted. Just think about if constantly you're checking in to see if an attack is happening while you're trying to do other stuff. But the Xanax did nothing for me. It made me a little sleepy. So I was on it. Or I, Sorry, I shouldn't say I was on it. I had it. I told her that. And she said, that has nothing to do. It's like that it will fix zero your problems. So I actually like to hear that. Somebody was like, wow, you 
you kind of, she kind of threw the law down. So I went in there, it was an audiologist's office in uh, the med center and went in, had a bunch of tests done and saw the otoneurologist and he basically kind of him hawed around it and he said, well, you kind of have some years like things. The only thing is you don't have hearing loss. And I said, but I do have hearing loss. He's like, well, your, your hearing's fine, but your, your hearing is down, but it's down because of kind of what you're talking about. And I said, is it Meniere's or not? I was really frustrated. I was mad. I was like, is it or not? I need to know what's going on. And you're the expert. And uh, so he said, well, yeah, I think you kind of have some Meniere's. And I said, well, what do we do about it? And he's like, well, you need to cut your sodium and you need to give up caffeine and uh, let me know how it goes. I was like, are you serious? That's that's my treatment. Come on, you've got to have a pill. You've got to have something you can do, like a position you can put me through. Well, ironically, I had given up caffeine already. I was a 10 cup a day drinker, but I noticed one morning that uh, when this was when my symptoms were going on, that I kept getting these little twitches. But they started after I was drinking caffeine. After I sit down, I have a couple cups at home, and I'd have one on the way to work, and I'd have some more at work. But I noticed that like these little sensations would go on, and they started after I drank caffeine. Well, I had. I had one the next morning I for the first time in since I was a freshman in college which would have been 18 years at the time or 16 years whatever it was I didn't have coffee one morning and I actually didn't have those ticks so I had cold turkey given up caffeine but I didn't know anything about the sodium issue so I went home and I said I told my wife as she because she was kind of with me on it and she said what he's saying, I'm like, I was kind of, I was very frustrated. I said, he just told me to do this and that's it, you know? So I had tried many other homeopathic treatments. Believe me, there's so many things out there and it's, that's a whole nother topic. We can get to that in a minute. But, um, so anyway, I started, I was at, at, at Baylor and so I eat lunch every day at the cafeteria and I went the next day and I got a salad and I got something else. I don't remember what it was, but I know it was a salad. I think a baked potato. And so I did that and I didn't get worse. So the next day I did it again. I thought, well, this is weird. All of a sudden my little nystagmus, my shaky vision, which I, was the first thing I check in the morning. Everything I, every t- morning I'd wake up, I'd look at a point on the wall. If it's shaken, that was key that I'm still, this problem's not gone away. I noticed that next, like the third or fourth morning that my vision was very point specific. I could stare at something and my, it wouldn't shake very microscopically. A couple days later, I noticed that I could hear out of my ear again. The howling was gone and the fullness was gone. So I I got really excited because I thought this was, I thought it was like, you know, ridiculous treatment. All of a sudden it starts to work. So I think I I saw them and I got diagnosed in November of 2011. So all through the spring, I'm getting better and better and better and things are going great. So the problem with that is you get a little complacent. And I still remember one day, uh, May of 2000, and uh, by the way, my wife was pregnant May of 20, uh, sorry. Yeah. May of 2012, our daughter was supposed to be born in June. Uh, one Sunday I made a pot roast in the crock pot and I put complacently put two packs of onion soup mix in there. And so ate it Monday, had a little weird sensation, kind of got nervous. Like, well, that was, uh, Oh, What's going on? Tuesday, I was doing an experiment uh, in the morning. Walked across go, to go to the same salad bar over in the Meth- in Methodist Hospital. I a huge place. I will plug that place. I love that that place they have there. But um, went out the building, went to cross the street at, at the intersection. I can't remember the streets. It's right there next to the fountains at in front of Baylor. Stepped off the curb and the, my the horizon went vertical. It went from, I could, you know, see the ground here. The ground was now sideways. I was down on the ground in the middle of the intersection instantly. I like, by the time my foot hit the ground, there was no warning. It wasn't like, uh Oh, here it comes. It was, I took a step and the my vision shifted. The ground went sideways. And so your brain can't figure that out. So you just fall down. It's called a drop attack or falls crisis of two markings. what they call it. Fell down. And people rushed around. I was embarrassed. I was mad. I was a hundred times more mad because it's happening again. I thought I fixed it. Uh, so I actually, about 
30 seconds later, I could kind of feel where I was at. The vision started to return enough that I could get, and I knew it was coming. Like they would usually have a bad initial event. And then about five minutes later, it really kicks in. So I hightail, I said, leave me alone. I'm fine. I just got something with my middle. I tried to blow it off. Something wrong with my middle ear. And I remember these older ladies like, oh, you poor thing. Do you want to see? I was like, no, just leave me alone. Let me go. I had to get back to where my experiment was because I needed to get back there before it hit. Because if it hits, I can't function. I can't walk. So I go back in the building, go down in the room, way down in the bowels of the building, have my attack. And it was the worst attack I'd ever had. I still remember, and I wrote this in the book, is I was leaning over the counter. And I, when, we, when you transport mice at Baylor, you put, them, put the, ba- the, the little container they're in, you put it inside of a, of a paper sack just to make it more comfortable for them when you transport them. That sack happened to be in the trash can that I had underneath me that I remember was gonna, I was going to th- vomit in eventually. And I had my head against the, the uh, counter, and all, this, all you hear is tick, tick, tick. That was the sweat dripping off my chin onto that paper bag. And so I did it. The whole process happened. I, didn't, I don't think I slept in there, but I wanted to. And then I, I was done. I was just beyond done. And uh, I uh, got around, I called my, my, the, the otoneurologist cause he was just across the street, literally a quarter mile away. And I said, can you, can I come see him? And they said, he just left. I said, can I come in tomorrow? And he, he said, yes, let's make you a special appointment. So, cause he needs to, he needs to see you right after he wants to see you right after it happens. I went in there, Jeremy, and I have no qualms about saying I bawled my eyes out. I thought it was all coming back. I mean, I was, my daughter was going to be, this happened, I think, May 15th. My daughter was born, going to be born, was due on May, on June 1st. That was the farthest thing from my mind. I did not even care about anything else. I thought this was all coming back. And I, I went, I had a cure kind of for the last six months and it was really getting better. And now here it is again. No, it didn't at the time, it didn't click with me that I, it was probably the pot roast. But I was, I was at the lowest point of I will ever be at. I, I'm 100% sure of that. I mean, I, you can figure out what I'm talking about. It was a really, really bad time. And so went back in there, bawled my eyes out, and he kind of asked me some questions, and he said, did you do anything different? And then he said, I said, well, yeah, I did, you know, I did, I may have had some sodium, and because I kind of became a little more cognizant of sodium, but I wasn't, I got complacent. I wasn't reading every package. And so he said, it was probably the pot roast. He's, I was like, oh, God, that's right. Didn't even think about that. So he put me on some medicine called beta histine. He put me on a diuretic, which gets rid of sodium. And so when I left there, because the next step was, if this doesn't work, we're going to try injections of steroids into your ear to do through the eardrum. And I said, I don't want to do that, but I'm willing to do anything. I mean, I was, I was beyond, I don't even know where, how to explain it. I didn't care about anything else. Anything else in the world did not matter because I thought this would come back. So went home and I just at that time I got very passionate about sodium because the the, the belief is with Meniere's is that sodium retain helps you re, cause you to retain water or fluid and the ear is very sensitive to this and so at changes in ear in, in fluid volume affect your ear and they f- affect a lot of, there's a lot of processes I talk about it because it's it's very technical and it's not even really well understood so over the next two weeks um, of getting very strict about sodium, my, my symptoms slowly kind of it took longer than after the first time. They slowly went away. The nystagmus was gone again. No more attacks, no more unsteadiness. My daughter was born on June 7th, but I, I was still feeling bad enough that while, even while holding her for the first time, it, all I could think about was the Meniere's, like, because I was still extremely anxious. So I tell people Meniere's took my first, the joy of my fir- holding my first child you know because it was all it was I could think about I mean I still had every, I mean and I was involved with everything but in the my mind was completely dominated by is it back again and now I've got to provide for this child when I'm having these random nobody's got to hire somebody that has random attacks and is out for a day you know I, that was kind of what you think about so uh, I that's kind of it I got on a very low sodium diet and I'm still on it and I'm 99% symptom free for, and I have been, I, I use my daughter's birthday as my anniversary cause it was, you know, two weeks of her first birthday or for being born was my last attack. And I've had a couple little, I call them blips, but nothing 
significant and uh it's it's the sodium issue for me i have not had bpbv my ten- i still have tinnitus pretty significant it doesn't bother me at all because of uh the 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 psychological you just basically try and drown it out like kind of like there's a buzzing light in your over your head at first you notice it but then it kind of goes away over time um and then you know i kind of forget about many years too but i'm very 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 and people that i that i live with and work with can tell you i'm very strict about sodium because i will never i don't know what will happen if i go back to where i was and if and that and that can happen just by somebody makes me something and they didn't tell me that oh yeah i added three tablespoons of salt and i eat it and that may trigger an attack so i'm very strict on that and so my point in saying and telling the whole story is because because of that I've had BPPV, I've had Meniere's, I have Meniere's, I have tinnitus currently, and also I'm a little interested because I had those severe headaches. And so there's also a condition called vestibular migraine, which is usually people have migraines first and then have vestibular related vertigo, things like that, disequilibrium occur later on. And I'm like, well, man, maybe I had that too. Because vestibular migraine is not known to respond to sodium, whereas Meniere's is. So I don't think I was misdiagnosed. I may have been coincidence. Maybe the Meniere's was related to headaches or what. So I've had several vestibular disorders, and I knew nothing. I've never heard of any of them except tinnitus before I actually had them. So um, I, I, as I write in the book, I've done a lot of things since I've gotten better. And it's so funny. People will say, like, you know, oh, you're you're – you ran a marathon because you're in, you like fitness. No, I ran a marathon. I ran a, I ran my first half marathon. I ran my first marathon. I ran my fir- completed my first, uh, half Ironman. And I completed my Ironman 100% driven by Meniere's because if I ever go back to where I was, where you're basically largely incapacitated, I need to know that I did something in that time. So all the fitness goals, I, I hang gliding. I did that because I want to say I did that while I could, while I was normal. Because I don't know if it's coming back. Because you're never, it's, it's not curable, it's controllable. But if it comes back and I'm incapacitated, I don't want to say, well, I just wasted those six years. So the, the books I write are because, of, you know, there's a whole story behind them of why it would actually trigger me to start them. But it's like, okay, at least I've done something in my time being healthy but it's about, while I'm at it, since there's not really a good source out there, why not just write one so people like me can turn to something? There's, there's sources out there, but they're terrible. They're always referring you, you know, read my book. And then you start reading the book and it keeps telling you to sign up for their website and get the real information. I hate that. Uh, there's people out there that say things like, you know, get rid of your tinnitus by drinking celery juice. Come on. You know, these are very anecdotal, so I wanted to write a, something that was legit, scientifically based. I've got 100, 100 and some references in most of my books because I want people to have that information, not because I want to make money off of it. And there's a lot of people that use, the, use terribly written books to go and get people to buy a product or sign up, and that's their income. So, yeah, I mean, many things I did was because <clears throat> of Meniere's because I don't know if I'm going back there. And if I do, I'm not gonna be able to do these things. So at least I can tell my kids I did this and this and this, you know, so, so, you know, very long answer to your (laughs) original question, but that's why I'm interested in this. It's not just because I thought, oh, the vestibular system's really cool. I'm gonna read it. It's because I've done, I've been there. I know what the symptoms are and I know how little training athletic trainers have in this area. And it's, we need to fix that because there's so many people like me. I didn't get, I got hit in the head the first time but if I went to the doctor and said, oh, I'm dizzy all the time and, and I can't walk down a hall without holding on the walls, well, you must have lingering effects of your concussion. No, not at all. Completely different. You have an uncurable condition, but here's how we can treat it. Instead of saying, okay, go sleep it off, you know, stay in dark rooms and don't do homework or don't do any strenuous thought processes, that has nothing to do with it. You need dedicated treatment, and that's what a lot of people don't know, especially from the non-athlete population. So. All right, so here we are, um, athletic trainers. I'm working in the high school setting. I may have a kid get hit in the head. They're feeling dizzy. I had a, a girl get hit in, like, the ear by a softball, and she was dizzy, but she didn't have any sort of vision, uh, headaches, or, or anything like that, but she was having some dizziness problems. 
And so what are some of the things that we as athletic trainers need to learn or maybe some resources we need to go check out or some courses we need to do so that we can better understand and, and <laughs> help better serve our athletes? Um, you want me to give my plug? Well, sure. Because I actually, this is something that we talked about. I actually want this information to get out there. So I've written a book on BPPV. I've written one on Meniere's. I've written one on tinnitus. And now I'm actually, last night I have started the, the major, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, formatting for my current one, which is vestibular migraine. So I will, when you ask the question, how do we learn more about this? I will send any athletic trainer my book via PDF for free if they request it. They have to just email me because, and I'll give you the example. I'm, I'm going to open one just to tell you what it, like the usual format. The first thing I do is I talk about the anatomy of the ear because I, everybody needs to know what you're dealing with here. We're talking about otoliths and things like that. Next, I go into what is the condition? What's the research say? What is BPPV? Okay, well, BPPV appears to be, for the traditional kind, it's, it's when the, the otoliths get caught in the vestibular or the, the semicircular canals. We also have intractable BPPV, which is not curable. And sometimes they can even go and take little bone chips and plug up your semicircular canals. Um, then I usually talk, I'll tell my story. So this is why I relate to it. And then I talk about the testing and the treatment of it. So very research heavy. This is my BPPV book. I've got 91 references. Uh, tinnitus, I think I've got 160 references. So my point in saying that is I want the information out to athletic trainers. I'm not saying I'm a physician. I, can't, I won't diagnose and say this is probably what you have, but I want us to open up to that, us as athletic trainers, I want us to open up to that possibility. Let's, let's have that discussion that you got a girl get hit in the ear. The ears, the 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 temporal bones got the densest bone in it in your uh, surrounding your uh, your vestibular system. So forces all get transferred there very easily. So I will, if they email me, I will be happy to send them the entire copy of their book for free via PDF. The only thing I ask is that they post a review, honest review of the book online on on the Amazon page. That's all I ask in return. I'm not gonna ask for any I don't want any payment I just want them to, to at least read it learn up on, learn up on the material and then um, you know become educated in it because it's I, it's written for the patient so it's in a very I think laid back I've, I've asked people to review it they've said it's very readable to even to non-medical people so I want the information to get out there so yeah to answer your question that's where it starts you got to get educated on it because we're not teaching our curriculum I'm <laughs> I'm actually changing that because I'm teaching gen med this summer and we're going to have a very detailed uh, lecture set of lectures on the vestibular system because there's so many conditions. And again, for, I'll mention it again, we've got to get out of the athlete mindset. We're not talking just about athletes. We're talking about geriatrics. Now geriatrics, every one of these conditions is prevalent in that population. The older you get, the more likely you get BPPV, vestibular migraine, tinnitus, and tinnitus is a symptom. So it's not a condition. We have to be careful of that but it's more prevalent in those individuals. So as we move into those emerging settings, this is something that we need to have in a, a discussion about for sure. <clears throat> so if you want to get one of his books, then you email him, read it, write a review real yeah, quick. Actually, give... let, email me at my personal email. It's M-A and then my last name at gmail.com. So M-A-K-N-O-B-L-A-U-C-H at gmail.com. I, ha I won't do anything related to books when it comes to work because I, I don't want any... That's my oh, books is my um, is my hobby that I do. I quit watching TV. I go home and I write now, but I don't I don't want it involved with my work. So make sure you email me at my personal address. All right, so I'll make sure I have that in at sportsmedicinebroadcast.com slash disequilibrium. So real quick, Jamie McFarland, Sarah Jackson, Jesse Lopez, Blake Lapierre, Russell Sadbury, all joining live, watching watching there on the live stream. Thanks for checking in. Um, all right, so we're again talking about imbalance and disequilibrium and how athletic trainers need to learn more because dizziness following a any sort of head trauma may not be a concussion so you know obviously you shared your story and that was really cool and you probably just saved me like an hour or two of reading of the book that i was reading <laughs> you did uh, just one chapter you got to read the you got to oh, read man. chapters two and three the anatomy and what's what we think it is you got to read those <laughs> okay all right so I'll, I'll finish reading up on those and then we'll go from there um 
right, and you just said you're you're going to change Gen Med there at the U of H Masters of Athletic Training Program so that it includes more of the vestibular stuff. Um, so what are some of the other vestibular conditions that may come into play there for Again, I'm I'm at this the high school, the secondary mm-hmm. setting. So for me as a secondary uh high school secondary setting athletic trainer, what are some of the things I need to consider? Yeah. So what we do is we look at prevalence. When we ask that went to that question, what what conditions most affect this population? And I, I was shocked to read this, but tinnitus, even though tinnitus again, it's a symptom. It's not a condition. It's just like saying saying I have tinnitus is the same as saying I have pain. It's not a condition. We don't know what causes it, but Tinnitus is actually very prevalent in kids. And one of the problems going back to concussions is a lot of times kids don't even know they have it until we ask them about it. So you go to your girl that got hit in the head and you say in a quiet room, do you have any ringing in your ears? And she'll stop for a minute. Oh, I do. What is your first thought? Oh, concussion. Got to be a concussion because you have got hit in the head and you have ringing in the ears. Or there's a very good chance this person actually had, had tinnitus before that existed. The, the, the other thing about tinnitus as a condition, or sorry, as a symptom, is it, it doesn't necessarily mean anything. It's kind of quite popular. Um, it's well known that only about 10% of people that have it actually get medical treatment for it or seek medical treatment for it. So a lot of people live with it. So it's highly underdiagnosed in terms of, or underrepresented in terms of prevalence. Um, the other one you have to watch for that I'm, I would recommend is is vestibular migraines. Vestibular migraines are usually kids that have recurrent headaches and they also complain of dizziness. And part of the problem with that is in kids, vestibular migraine usually in kids peaks around age 14. And then we'll see a second peak around the age of 45, which is really interesting because that actually hints that there might be a hormonal thing. We've got puberty going on and we've got menopause, post, well, menopause, around those those two time points but kids actually have a condition a lot of times called position or benign positional vertigo and that's it, not bppv it's not positional uh or i'm sorry it's not paroxysmal but they actually complain of headaches dizziness etc at a younger age and that tends to lead into migraine or sorry vestibular migraine where they're it's it's one of it's one not only is it one of the most common well in kids it's the most common uh, dizziness-related condition, but it also can become extremely debilitating, as in disability-type type scenario where they just they can't work physically. There's just no way. So the other problem is it's not really well treatable. So there's certain medications, and so it's unfortunate that we have these diseases that that are extremely debilitating. They come out of nowhere. You don't know when they're going to hit. Sometimes they have aura. People get a little bit of warning, but they. Uh, they're uh, effectively, you know, you, you're stuck with it for life currently because, and in, in I'll tell you what, reading the Facebook groups of these conditions are very depressing because you see there's people that get on there and say that uh, I, I haven't been able to type this for two days because I've been in bed. And then you get even worse is, is when you hear things like, my husband doesn't believe I have this. I got terminated because I couldn't go to work because they because they, they don't believe it. There's not a lot of outward signs. I mean, think of when you have a cold. Okay, I see you sniffling, but what you feel is completely different than what you're showing. I mean, you can come to work and probably get the job done, but I don't know how bad you feel. Well, now imagine that you can't stand up straight, that you're extremely fatigued, and every time you move, it basically feels like your your brain is getting this like tens unit on it's just this extremely electrical shaky feeling it's really weird but it's hard to explain i'll be the first to admit that if i didn't have it i would have no comprehension of what it was like so uh, to answer that you know look for constant dizziness with or without headache especially look for no head trauma because head trauma is not ruling it out but if they don't have it and the other thing you want to ask a lot of times is is there any family history of headaches in your family that's a uh, vestibular migraine is genetic. They think it's genetic related. So really ask that kind of question. And, and again, if the mechanism for a concussion is there, think concussion. If the concussion doesn't fit, move into something else. Don't keep saying, well, I just, I think you've got a concussion. They might, might have one, but they also might have another condition. They might have multiple conditions. They might have migraine and BPPV, for example. That's one of the, the hard things that, that, uh, hard things about diagnosing these is that 
I can't tell if you have one condition or you have multiple conditions. And that, that's very common. So if I give treatment for BPPV, expecting to do the Epley maneuver and, and roll you around and, and it goes away, well, it's not. But is it because you have another condition or, or, or what? So, But I, I will say these conditions are not as prevalent in high schoolers, but they do exist in high schoolers. So again, especially in this population, we just have to open that possibility up that, you know, let's start thinking if this is not fitting the mold of concussion, no, no memory loss, no loss of consciousness, obviously head trauma, maybe they had whiplash, whiplash can cause these as well. And, you know, we're only taught really not only taught, but we're, we really focused, we're really focused on our education on those topics or on that topic. So if it doesn't fit, let's move on. And what's the next best thing? Let's look at vestibular related. So. All right. So you've been talking about prevalence and, in the book, uh, I was reading the, the Meniere's one, and it said that it's most prevalent in females. Mm-hmm. So is that, in, and I think earlier you said between 40 and 70, or maybe it was in the book when I was reading it. So between the fourth and seventh decade. Fourth and seventh decade, yeah. Is, is when the Meniere's is the most, uh, most prevalent. But does that, does that age shift at all for females? So like, are we looking at, you know, 18-year-old females? I don't females? know about age shifting, but what's interesting on that note is that BPPV, vestibular migraine, and Meniere's are all more prevalent in females. Tinnitus is very debatable. There actually seems some, it, when I say debatable, it means some research says males, some say females, which kind of neutral neutralizes everything. But there is some argument that's actually more pre- prevalent in males. But then you get into the thing like, well, it's a symptom. So is it a perception thing? Like, do male, are males more sensitive to it or, or what? So yes, there, this is, all of these conditions are more prevalent in the older population. But and that ends there because they're also can happen in younger, including tinnitus. People don't hear about tinnitus in kids. And it's really interesting. I talk about this is that um, kids don't, don't care either. They act, the, in, I think it's in the Netherlands, they actually have sound warnings where if the sound is too great, too loud, they actually have to turn it down. Kids don't care. Kids listen to music, whatever. If you're in a restaurant and then the construction noise is too loud, they have to, they have to make an adjustment to that. Kids don't care. Older people do. So they found that kids are more interested in things like fashion and social status than they are about their hearing until later on there's a problem. And then it's like the normal person is, well, damage is done. But with tinnitus, we don't know what it is. We don't know where it comes from. We have a lot of theories. Some people say that, well, when you lose hairs, sorry, nerve cells in your ear, uh, your brain creates a sound to, to fill in that gap. Well, Maybe, but if that's the case, then deaf people would be have tinnitus, and they don't all have tinnitus. Some do, um, but there's a lot of theories. We don't know where it comes from. We don't know what it affects. We don't know why it exists, but it's there. It's so. It's in fact, they. I think one of the prevalence is one in ten people have it, but only ten percent of people that have it seek medical attention. So there's a lot of people that have it that are not getting treatment for it. So, um, but yeah, to answer that original question. Uh, three of the four that I'm most familiar, I, I can't remember, we have acoustic neuroma. There's a lot of conditions out there, that, but the most prevalent ones are the ones we've talked about. Acoustic neuroma, labyrinthitis, some of those. I don't remember the prevalence on those, but three of the four we've talked about, most prevalent in females. Yeah. And we don't know why. All right. So other than reading your books, which you said you'll send out using M-A Knobloch at, what was it? At gmail.com. At gmail.com. So if you email Dr. Knobloch, he'll send you one of his books. And they have, to, they have to request the, which one they want to. Yeah. And so tell them yeah. which one you want. So other than, than reading your books, where else might I go to to learn about this in a, I guess, less scientific, more... Um, or less researcher because I'm not I'm not mm-hmm. into seeing all these case studies. Like I just let me tell tell me about it. Tell me about how I can yeah. apply it. So where else where else might that's a someone? really good question because you have to still be able to separate the facts from the anecdotes. And I'm t- there are a lot of people on the website, and I I I think I catch on to this more because of my training. Um, but there's people that will put a website up about tinnitus cure. You know, here's what tinnitus is. Here's how you can fix it. You know, I've seen, like I said, garlic, basil, uh, celery juice. I heard, I saw there was a Facebook post the other day that one person, her vestibular migraine is because of a demon in mm-hmm. her body, and she needs to get the, de- she can't get the demon out because she's not remorseful enough. And I get so frustrated in that. But I'll tell you, Jeremy, people are so desperate with 
as, as a former patient, I know how bad it is and I know how frustrating it is. I, I told you, I was at the lowest point in my life because I was 38 years old and I'm think, thinking I've got to live with this the rest of my life, 40 more years, and that ain't happening. I'm not doing it. I would have done anything at that time. If somebody told me that I got rid of mine doing this, I would have probably bought it at the time. And so it's very easy to fall into that mindset. So what I recommend you do is go to the legit sites to, to stay. If you don't want to go to Google Scholar and Medline, go to the to the sites of an otologist's or an ENT's website, and they will oftentimes talk about these things. What they'll, it'll be a title of what is vestibular migraine? What I really wish people would do is go to Google Scholar and type in vestibular migraine review. B, what is BPPV? And find a review that kind of sums up everything versus, you know, I, I don't want you to, you're not going to learn as much from reading a study about how they, uh, how they reduced BPPV in, in a certain population. Cause that's very specific about that. You want to find reviews and they talks about everything. What's the prevalence? What's the epidemiology? What's the common treatments? Uh, what's the causes, all that stuff in one, if you can get that, but it gets very scientific too. And that's what I try to do is take that information and put it into a readable format. Cause my, my writing style is for patients, not for scientists, not for researchers, not for physicians. It's so they can, when they have, they get diagnosed with Meniere's, well, what is this? They'll go to Amazon, they'll search for a book. Well, hopefully they'll see that mine's written for them and that's what it's designed to do. So, yeah, it, uh, for, without purchasing anything, I would say go to a legitimate medical site. I mean, you can go probably WebMD. I'm not, uh, Wikipedia from what I've read is pretty good on most of these. They, they talk pretty well. But the thing is those things can be edited by anybody. So it, there's always that caveat of, of, did somebody change this? But I think that's your best site because I tell you where you won't find it is the NATA <laughs> and I'm not picking on them. I'm just saying that's not the topic. Their, their topic, they have 2014 concussion guidelines. I want to see vestibular related things because it, it mimics that. And there's, a, you know, and there's other people that will say intestinal related disorders are what we need to be focusing. And I get that. That's, this is my area. This is what I've dealt with. I'm very well versed in what goes on. So this is my area, but I'd love to see, you know, a review put out in something like that. So we can get the, get our specific population edit, ed, educated on this topic. Yeah. All right, so other than books and obviously the podcast here, what other things are you doing to help engage people? Like I, I know you're speaking at the Memorial Hermann mm -hmm. Sports Medicine Update. Is it regarding this? Not this year. Um, I'm go I, I've talked to Bob Marley, and I said, you know what? Chris Shields is very – he's a PT. He, he spoke on it last year, so I said, let's wait a year. So I'm actually speaking on a different topic, prevalence – or not prevalence, uh, diagnostic accuracy, which is a favorite of mine, but it has nothing to do with, with uh, vestibular disorders. Um, I want to try and get a, something written in the NATA, uh, journal of athletic training just to, just to get this information out there. But my, my passion is book writing. I actually quit watching TV and it was funny. I, I don't want to ruin my future show, but I was sitting there one night and I was, uh, watching King of Queens for what I tell people had to been the 40th time I've seen the episode. I knew the lines. I mean, I, I love that show and I sat, sat was sitting there and my that night my wife had put our kids down because it was her turn and I was watching I'm like what am I doing you know what how are my kids gonna get anything out of what's my what's my legacy gonna be you know wh well he re they just say at my funeral well he really liked his king of queens woo that really gets you a lot so I actually went and I said you know what I want I had wanted to write a book I had already gotten one done or started on professional writing and I said I just want to write a book. And so I took the Meniere's and I said, I looked at what was out there and I said, this isn't what conducive. It's not written. It's written by somebody who's not a writer, which is fine, but it was the only book on the market really. And so it was a very good seller. I said, I can do better than this. I can give them the science aspect, which that book didn't do. It, it did a little bit, but um, I wanted to provide, I want to talk about quality of life. I want to talk about treatments and, and things like that. And so I literally just turned the TV off and started writing. And so that's what I do now. I go home and, you know, do my job and then go home, play with kids. They go to bed. I write for two hours a night and it's my hobby. And so vestibular disorders has become my passion. I want to put out, I'm putting out one now that I'm finishing up. I want to put out a couple 
guides on it's not a book it's it, i don't want to give too much information away but it's not actual learning book it's about uh something it's a resource that patients could use i guess for a couple disorders and so that's kind of my big thing but i want speaking opportunities i you know i again i'm not a physician i'm not going to go talk to a bunch of physicians other than maybe from a patient's perspective i could talk to them about what i experienced there's patients that say that you are not experiencing this. You're, you are not, it's all in your head. And it's like, you know, I would love the, the chance, the chance to speak to them about that. But I want to talk to patients, athletic trainers that, that just, I think need more information. I'm not saying they don't know anything. I hope they know the vestibular system pretty well, but here's a person, you know, Dr. Yellen has his topic. You could talk about the adoption process. You're an expert in that. Nobody's going to know it that you talk to as well as you do because you've been through it. So this is kind of my area. So I'm, you know, I want to go talk to people like at the sports medicine broadcast or at SWATA. I think actually I submitted at SWATA to, to talk about this very topic. I don't know if it's been accepted or not yet, but it's something that we just, I just, let's get the information out. Let's educate people about this particular topic because it's just not been a focus. And, and I understand why it's not a hot topic. And so let's try and get it there because of the populations we're with and the prevalence of the conditions as well. All right. I think that's a great intro to the next time I have you on the podcast, Dr. Now Black. We were talking with uh, Dr. Jeff Conan as well and talking about publishing a book. So you can look for that one as well. So if you're interested in publishing a book, obviously Dr. Now Black has some experience. You can email him at m a knoblock at gmail.com to request one of these books that he's written on vestibular disorders and then again he said if you're not going to buy one of his books then he's not going to help you out but no i'm just kidding he said go to google scholar and look for the reviews that's a, another great option as we're just considering if the mechanism for a concussion is not there then don't don't proceed with treating it as a concussion because there are other options. Just know that it may be a vestibular injury, a vestibular disorder that may need some more digging into because there's not a whole lot of depth and research and understanding or, or I guess widely accepted research. Um, and so if it doesn't act like a concussion or uh, I guess if it acts like a concussion, I'm getting a little confused here. <laughs> if if it is if it, if somebody wasn't hit in the head or doesn't have the majority of the concussion signs, then then let's look at other options as yeah. well. So again, if you want to contact Doctor Knobloch, see, and I even typed it wrong on here. <laughs> M A Knobloch, K N O B L A U C H at gmail dot com. Tell him which book you want. Then he'll send you that book. You can read up on it. Uh, leave him a review on you have Amazon. To, you have to agree to leave me a review. Honest review. I'm not saying good or bad. You just have to tell tell how, what you thought of the book. Leave him a review on Amazon and then go from there. And then you can check out his other ones. I'm sure Amazon will have a recommended by this author as well kind of thing. Um, so final parting words on vestibular injuries. Yes. Learn up on it. <laughs> Don't rule it out do your best. I mean, that's part of our profession. We're always trying to learn more. I, I, I want us to give that, that area an opportunity, start the discussion, figure out what you know, what you don't know, look at your patient population. What could they be affected with that might, uh, might be something that, that, that you have, you could recognize and get them the proper treatment. Cause if it's not diagnosed, they can't get the proper treatment. If they can't get the proper treatment, they're not going to get better. There you go. All right. So I want to also mention Dragonfly Max, Myotech, Free hydration, uh, all supporters of the sports medicine broadcast. And I know this is supposed to come out in March, and that's when we're doing National Athletic Training Month, so lots of cool prizes. So if you just happen to listen to this, it's coming out at the end of March, then it's not too late to sign up for some of the, the cool things we're giving away here on the sports medicine broadcast. So for Jeremy, Dr. Knobloch, who is willing to give you one of his books for free if you just request, a, request it from him, uh, and the sports medicine broadcast as we're talking about imbalance and disequilibrium, that is a wrap.